Yes, so I will be presenting uh, the reach search that we have uh, done, which uh, considers uh, predicting valvular heart disease uh, from heart sounds uh, collected with a stethoscope uh, in uh, an unselected cohort or uh, more like a general uh, population, which is, does not consist of patients that have been referred by a doctor <coughs> or, uh, or are perhaps symptomatic. So a very general population, which is a, a novel feature in automated uh, heart sound classification research to our knowledge. Um, so yeah, left valvular heart disease is the target that we wanted to predict from heart sounds. Uh, I have sketched uh, a heart here on the left with the two valves colored, the mitral valves and the aortic valves. And, <coughs> sorry. and the, the job of these valves is to ensure that blood flows in the right direction. Now, there are two things that uh, can uh, go wrong here, or two types of uh, dysfunction or pathology. Uh, they can fail to uh, open properly, or they can get too narrow due to, for instance, calcification building up over the years. That's uh, referred to here as a stenosis. Or they can fail to close properly, uh, and that can and that results in uh, leakage or backflow or regurgitation, as it's called in this context. So you combine the name of the valve with the name of the one of these two dysfunctions, and you get for diseases such as aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation. So uh, on the right here, uh, we have the general setup where we take four stethoscope recordings, uh, 10 seconds each on a person's chest. And then uh, we feed those uh, sounds. The idea is then to have a neural network or some machine learning al algorithm take that input of four sounds and generate a classification of VHD type and the severity grade, how far the disease has progressed. And primarily what we are uh, looking for is the so-called murmurs. Uh, which are these swooshing sounds that are generated by turbulent blood flow that you get due to the stenosis or the regurgitation. Uh, but they don't have to be pathological. You can have innocent murmurs also, which don't indicate uh, pathology. So the, the murmur is sort of the, the, uh, the surrogate or the next best thing to predict if you cannot predict VHD directly. So here is a sketch of the data material we had to work with. Uh, there were uh, approximately 2,100 participants with four recordings per person. And each of these uh, recordings was, uh, uh, was graded on a sca uh, scale from one to six based on the loudness, uh, roughly speaking, based on the loudness or intensity of the murmur, if there was one. Otherwise, they were, they were assigned a grade of zero. And then we had as our um, as our gold standard, or the thing that we were uh, most interested in, the uh, severity grade of each of these four diseases uh, on a scale of one to three or one to four, depending on the disease. And um, so um, originally we wanted to, to train the network to predict uh, valvular heart disease directly. <laughs> Um, but this, long story short, this ended up not working too well. And uh, probably the, the most important reason for that is the nature of this data set where we just don't have many diseases, examples, and the diseases that are there need not be very, very well expressed, so to speak. They can be very, very hard to detect versions of the disease because they haven't, many of them haven't been diagnosed or detected yet. So we ended up uh, deciding to use murmurs or murmur grade as the thing that we trained the algorithm to predict. So we took the recordings from each of the four positions and we sort of stacked them together into a single data set and did the same with the murmur grades and then trained the network to uh, map the recording to murmur grade. And that worked quite well. <laughs> And uh, so specifically, we used a recursive neural network, uh, a long short-term memory network. 
because uh, these uh, going through the literature, these seem to produce some of the most impressive results, if not the most impressive results. Uh, they're also quite uh, the one we used uh, and mimicked was a very sort of lightweight, uh, didn't have that many parameters, trained quite quickly and predicts quite quickly, which is nice when you're doing lots of experimentation. And they take as input either a representation of the whole recording, or more commonly, you give it one piece at a time of the signal, and then you predict on the pieces, and then you do some kind of averaging or voting in order to get prediction for the whole recording. And you can standardize the length of uh, these uh, pieces uh, on the basis of uh, time duration, so say three second, second snippets, or you can do it uh, based on the number of uh, cardiac cycles uh, by extracting uh, a certain number of cycles using some kind of segmentation algorithm that is able to tell what is what in the signal. So where's the first heartbeat, where's the second, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> specifically, we used uh, for this task, oh yeah, so, so that's what we ended up uh, uh, going for, because uh, when we use that as input, uh, that produced much better results than using uh, snippets of fixed time duration. Uh, we use something called Springer's uh, segmentation algorithm by Springer et al. And uh, it's a very popular uh, algorithm for this purpose. And uh, uh, it's open source, which is nice. And uh, below here in the figure here, you can see uh, an illustration of what this algorithm does. So it divides the signal up into four different cardiac states. Now, it worked quite well, but every once in a while it would have this uh, strange behavior, despite the recording being of quite good quality. Uh, it seemed as if it was going through uh, the cycles at a rate that was twice as high as it was supposed to. Uh, so, it, so we looked into what it was doing, and it estimates first the heart rate, and then that heart rate that that parameter is used as input to the actual segmentation uh, uh, step. So uh, what it does is that it calculates an autocorrelation function of the envelope of the sig signal. And that autocorrelation function allows you to see at what time lags the, the, the signal starts repeating itself. So for instance, in this case, at time one second, we can see that there's a big spike, and that's because that's the length, that's the amount of time that it takes for one uh, heartbeat, uh, one cardiac cycle. And if there's a repetition at one second, then you also get one at two seconds, three seconds, and so on and so forth. So what, what the algorithm does is that it takes the maximum across a fixed interval and takes that peak to be representative of the heart rate. But you can see here an example of how that can go wrong, where the second or the, the sort of the repetition of the first peak gets uh, picked up instead. So we implemented a change where or a fix to this, where it takes the peak that it finds first. And then on the basis of that peak, it constructs this search region where it looks to see if there is a peak in this region, I believe that's the thing I'm actually looking for. And what I found at first is merely a repetition of that. And that simple fix, uh, fix fixed a lot of issues. Now, then we thought that, okay, uh, we know that the algorithm needs to first uh, estimate the heart rate in order to do, uh, to do a good job segmenting the audio. Uh, we know that this can go wrong uh, because the autocorrelation function can get quite messy sometimes. And uh, so given that we have four recordings per person, and the recording tends to have more or less the same average heart rate, it makes sense to allow them to, to sort of cross-reference and check with the other positions to see if their estimate is likely to be correct or not. Um, so to, uh, to do this, we wanted to uh, define a quality score for each uh, recording, for, uh, for each autocorrelation function to say, how much do we trust the estimate generated by this autocorrelation function? And uh, this, uh, this uh, confidence score, as we called it, reflects uh, firstly how periodic the, the autocorrelation function is, how regular it is, uh, because that's a characteristic of the ones that uh, you want to use. 
and also how distinct or how prominent the peaks are and how tall the peaks are, how much they stand out. And then we set, set up a rule which essentially says that a position should discard its own estimate if its estimate deviates greatly from the average of the other three positions, especially if it has received a low uh, quality score on the autocorrelation function, and also especially if the other three positions really agree with each other a lot. So here is an example of this in praxis. So at the top, so these are all based on uh, rec four recordings from one person. And at the top, you have the autocorrelation functions, the, the blue lines. And in the upper right corner, uh, it has detected an incorrect peak. And uh, you, when you look at the behavior of this function, it's not so hard to see why, because it seems to have this strange, slow oscillating behavior. And what that actually represents is the breathing rate. So that particular recording had very loud interference, very strong interference from breathing, and that's causing issues here. So what the algorithm then notices is that it, it finds a heart rate of 106, but the other three position have uh, heart rates that roughly say 67 or 68. So they really agree with each other and there's big deviation. And also the confidence score for this position is very low compared to the, the guy that receives the highest segmentation score or confidence score of 96. So it ends up concluding, I don't trust my own estimate. I'm going to go to the best looking autocorrelation function and borrow the heart rate estimate for that. And uh, that produced uh, significant improvements. So we, we checked this in eightfold cross-validation, where we um, trained networks using input generated either by the original uh, algorithm or the modified algorithm. And then we compared the results using the area under the curve for predicting various different targets. So for instance, for predicting murmur grade two or higher, uh, the original had an AUC of 0 0.936 and the modified had an AUC of 0 0.972 with a very significant p-value associated with that. And uh, also for the other targets, we got a similar story. Also for aortic stenosis prediction, there was a significant improvement. So improving segmentation performance really seemed to, uh, to benefit this, uh, this algorithm, this uh, network. <clears throat> so here are the um, ROC curves for uh, the final murmur detection algorithm's uh, ability to predict murmur grade higher than one and two, respectively. And uh, for grade two or higher, it got an AUC of 0 0.97, which we were uh, very happy with considering the subjectivity of the label that we were trying to predict. And uh, we, we, we are of the opinion that uh, we're getting to a point where we don't think we can really eke out that much more performance in terms of uh, predicting these murmurs. Here are uh, similarly ROC curves for uh, predicting each of the significant cases of each valvular heart disease, where we have used the predicted murmurs to in turn predict heart disease. Uh, valvular heart disease. And the thing that clearly stands out here is that regurgitation is very poorly predicted. Both AR and MR are very poorly predicted. And we spent, uh, we focused a lot on this on our article explaining why that is. Uh, but in short, uh, it has to do with the fact that in a general population consisting of many undiagnosed and asymptomatic cases, these are simply extremely hard to detect uh, diseases. There just isn't really any expression in the recording that these diseases are present. Um, so it doesn't seem to be so much to do with the performance of the network, but more to do with the fact that it's been given an almost impossible task in a lot of the cases. But aortic stenosis and to some degree mitral stenosis were very well detected. And we were a bit fortunate with uh, this situation because it turns out that AS is often cited as being the most clinically important VHD to detect because it's very dangerous to not treat it if, if you have it. And it's also quite prevalent. 
but we were interested in how can you uh, how can you best predict aortic stenosis with uh, the predicted murmur grades that you have, or just murmur grades in general? Uh, so if you look into a textbook, medical textbook, they will often mention the aortic position and sometimes also the pulmonic position as sort of the preferred positions uh, that are anatomically well situated to pick up the AS murmur. Uh, but we figured we have this data, so why not let, uh, why not let the computer decide uh, how to make best use of this information, particularly a regression model. Now, there were only 45 cases of aortic stenosis, and we thought if we try out a bunch of different models and pick the best one, we are surely going to be overfitting at the model selection stage. So we opted to choose a, uh, to, to work with the sort of the continuous analog of uh, aortic stenosis, the, the, the thing that we used to define aortic stenosis, which is the aortic valve pressure gradient, or the average of that. And that's, this is a continuous variable. And it, here's our, here is a scatter plot of it. And uh, at the bottom is the square root of this pressure gradient. Uh, that was done because uh, that produced a better, uh, better fit uh, when mapping murmur grade to the pressure gradient. And also a nice thing is that it sort of reduces, it spreads out the data a little bit and reduces the leverage of uh, the most extreme outliers. So it should help to protect a little bit against overfitting as well. And here are the uh, fitted parameters and the final model. And the most important thing to note here is that uh, all the uh, murmur grades were highly significant, contributed highly significantly to the prediction. And uh, this was somewhat surprising to us because you can easily imagine a situation where uh, once you have the aortic and maybe also the pulmonic position, uh, surely the positions that are sort of further away, not as well situated, they can at best give you redundant information. But that ended up not being the case. And we saw a significant improvement to performance when we just used everything in uh, this kind of, uh, in this fashion. So, um, uh, in summary, uh, we were able to detect aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis very well from predicted murmurs. But uh, for AR and MR, we believe that you need to go with different methods. It just did not, did not work very well. Uh, although using various different clinical variables such as uh, age, gender, heart rate, that very significantly boosted performance. So that seems like a more fruitful approach. Um, we made significant improvements to a segmentation algorithm, which translated to uh, significantly better murmur prediction and aortic stenosis prediction. And we filed for a patent on that modified method. And we also developed a method for predicting aortic stenosis in an optimal way using all the murmur grades uh, from all the four positions, uh, rather than using only one or two, which is what we have seen done in previous research. And um, and that worked, uh, yeah, it, it worked well. So so the plan for the second part is that now Caniclas has sort of provided the, the scientific foundation for our work, like just a, like a regular paper presentation. So now we're going to go into sort of the commercialization and open science part of the project. And the hope is that by seeing a concrete example of someone who has gone through this process, it's useful for like understand how you can do that for, for your own own research. So just to start by giving a background. So the background is that we're using data from the Thompson study, which is like a big population study from like the generic population. So in other words, we have a very good data set for working on screening type of, of problems. So finding things in the general population versus a, a clinic. And the first thing we did in this, the first thing we did, so we, we started working on, on the lung sounds. And these were annotated by Hassan Elmi and his, his team. And the result, of it worked quite well. So we ended up doing a startup called Medsensio. And you can see now, like, that's one of the products of Medsensio. It has some of these visualizations that maybe Benjamin was asking about, like, where in the things that, that are the sounds detected. And then uh, later, yeah, so later, Hassan and his team, they started also annotating the heart, heart sounds. 
So we, of course, then we wanted to do something similar as we had done for the lung sounds in, in this project. And since we already had Metensio, like it, the company exists and they're sort of world leading on machine learning on stethoscope sound, it made perfect sense for them to join the project so that we could basically do this uh, very quickly. And also late uh, the Aarhus, why the cardiologist Henry Schilmer joined, joined the project. And also from the very start, we had a name that we want. This was something that we saw that this is potentially commercializable. But of course, we also wanted to do open science. So just to start on the conversation process, I'm giving the date, sort of you see the timeline, how long does the different steps take? So the first conversation step is to submit the so-called disclosure of invention. And we, when we do, did this in April, we had like done most of the things that Pediclas presented. So we basically could, uh, like the idea for the invention was that we're going to do something with heart disease and screening. We had the description of the invention, which basically was the abstract of the paper. We describe what the intervention is that I'm not going to show here. And also quite importantly, we have to report that this is not something that has been published. In other words, it is patentable, if that's interesting. And then the second part of this disclosure of invention is something called the inventor's contribution agreement. So in our, in our case, all the co-authors are inventors. And so we fill out this contract or this, this paper as part of the, the DOFI submission where we say that these are the inventors and these are the percentages they have of this, this invention. And like now is a time to say that we're not going to say anything about the trade dealings model. That usually creates a lot of questions. So please don't ask about that in, in this. Um, and then having done this, there is like in our contract, if you're employed at the UIT, and I guess UIO has something similar, is that after having submitted this though, there's a four month period where we're not allowed basically to publish this, these results. And in this case, I think the, the evaluation of the invention was quite clear since we had like a very clear commercial goal from the start on. So we UIT said, okay, we're going to take the rights for this, this invention. But and this happened sort of about three months after we had submitted DOFI. And at that point we had already started the, the patenting process. So how did we do the patenting? So it was actually from our point of view, it was quite easy. So we just provided the paper that we already had mostly written, the supplementary mat materials part of the paper, and also the, lawyer, the, the patent lawyers asked for some more detailed technical descriptions of, of the algorithms. And we provided this to Ink and the patent lawyers, and they basically wrote the patent for us. So we didn't have to, of course, we gave some feedback and we read through and answered question and so on, but it was from my point of view at least quite an easy thing to do. And then sort of about four months after we had submitted the DOFI, we got like a first patent was filed. And so it took about like four months of time and this included the summer break. So I think it went quite quickly. So it was quite a smooth process. But then about this time, we also discovered, oh, probably made a mistake. There's things that we should have put into the first panel, or maybe we could have put in. So we actually ended up deciding that we're going to actually write the second patent. And that one was filed uh, like a few, few weeks ago. And now the process is that like you know, the patents are kept secret, like from 18 months from the filing date until they are published. And we are recommended to not really show the, the patent content but for like, if you want to understand like the, what these patents are about, the first one is about the segmentation algorithm that Peniklas described. And of course the patents are written based on the paper that we submitted and you have access to the preprint. So you can go actually and check sort of what are the scientific foundation for, for this, this patent. And then the second patent, that's about the, uh, the, the machine learning model that actually does sort of the, the disease prediction part of our work. That's also described in, in the paper. And now I leave the word to Ingrid. I'd actually say a little bit more about what are the actual things we were doing and how they work. Yeah, thank you. So just from a technology transfer point of view, I just want to show you the, uh, the process. So now uh, Los Ailo has uh, uh, talked about the first uh, part where we have the DOFI evaluation. And then our goal for, from the technology transfer is actually uh, realizing the technology into the market. And that's done by either licensing the technology to established industry 
or creating a startup company that are, are able to take the technology to uh, to the market. And in between, we have uh, some development, and we call it project phase, uh, to make sure that the technology is ready uh, for licensing. And since this uh, uh, project were focused uh, a lot of about patents, I thought I'd talk a bit about the patents uh, in general. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with patents in general, uh, patents is just a legal document uh, describing a technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, and it uh, grants the owner of the patents a 20 year exclusive right uh, to the technology so that you in that period can commercialize the technology. In order uh, for a technology or uh, yeah, the, the solution to be patentable. It has to be new, as Lasalo uh, said. So that's why it's so important for us that uh, when the two fees uh, come into our, uh, to Noenova, that uh, we know that if there's uh, any uh, plans for publishing, because it can blow the whole patenting uh, if, uh, if um, it has been published already, because then it's not new. And then, uh, it has to also be um, sort of non-obvious, so it has to have what's called an inventive step, meaning that for people uh, working with this technology, it's not obvious that if you do A, you get B. Uh, so that's the sort of the formalities on it. And then just like a, a scientific paper, it has the, the sort of the document contain uh, enough information uh, of the of the technology so that it can be reproduced by external people. And uh, the most important part of a patent is actually the claim set, because that's really where if you get into disputes and it goes to a court of law, uh, that is really where you look into where the um, uh, if, if somebody has infringed your your patent. And uh, as uh, Lars also was describing, you know that the, in the DOFI uh, process, they had to list all of the owner uh, or the, um, the employers, which will be the owner of the of the technology, but also who has contributed the intellectual to the to the technology, because they will be listed on the patent. And then there are some uh, um, things that are not patentable, uh, like uh, natural occurring substances, laws of nature, uh, and ideas, and the sorts of that programs for computers as such. I think you should just disregard that because uh, often uh, software can be be um, patented if it's uh, if you can uh, describe it as a technical solution. Uh, but the whole point of uh, of these things that you shouldn't be allowed to patent this ethical reasons, so that you don't uh, uh, exclude people for doing research or, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the case of diagnosis, which is relevant for this case, uh, is that uh, it should be open. People should be, healthcare professionals should be able to uh, diagnose people without infringing any patents. And that was uh, sort of a bit of a concern uh, with this technology because uh, from a commercial point of view, and we're talking with MedSensor, which is part of this uh, project, of course, that's uh, from a commercial point of view, that is exactly what the uh, invention is really about. It's predicting uh, and uh, heart disease uh, and uh, being um, a tool to aid in, in diagnosis, which in itself is not patentable. However, there are parts of the uh, of the technology and the and the software as such uh, that can be described as a technical solution for a technical problem. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, the segmentation. That was the first things uh, we were looking at and that the patent attorney said this is obvious meeting the requirements for uh, a patent. Uh, then uh, the second patent uh, came about when we were discussing the software and trying to pinpoint about what are the 
uh, the most valuable pieces uh, within the software that can be protected. And luckily, uh, I would say that the inventors behind this project were a bit persistent in saying that, OK, we understand that it's not uh, a we are not able to patent the diagnosis. But uh, when you argue that uh, the aortic valve mean pressure gradient is not a, a diagnosis itself, but it's a number that healthcare professionals are uh, using as a, a way to determine or the diagnosing the heart, uh, heart failure. Uh, and that can be calculated. So that was a second uh, patent. And the reason we didn't put these two into one, we could have done that uh, even after filing the first patent, but the scope of, of these two patents are so divergent that we were not able to put it into one patent. So that's why, because you can't have too wide uh, scope of a patent. So the next thing I just wanted to touch upon, which is relevant for a lot of the project we are uh, involved in, is sort of the timeline. Because this, uh, when we file a, a patent, it's a clock that starts ticking. So in this figure, you can see sort of the, the different uh, process for a patent. So uh, at the month zero, it's where it's filed. And that's called the priority date. And up until the first 12 months, you can make amendments to uh, some of the claims that make minor adjustments to the patent. And you can also su uh, uh, submit um, additional uh, data uh, to support the claim set. After this time, uh, you're not able to do any changes to the patent. And then at 18 months, it's published. Uh, so it's the technology is open. Before 18 months, you can pull the patent uh, and it will not be public. And from a technology transfer point of view, the next sort of uh, time that's crucial for us is the 30 month uh, time box where we have uh, we're entering into a so-called national phases. It, this is where you have to pick which countries the patent should be valid within. Uh, and this is where the big money is uh, starting to, to uh, uh, accumulate and where the technology transfer and the university are not able to cover the cost anymore. Up until this point, uh, uh, university and uh, the technology transfer offices will cover the cost for the, the researchers at the universities. Uh, but that means that but, uh, by uh, 30 months after filing, uh, we have to have a license agreement going forward. But then I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so so far, so we have a patent, which is basically a protection of an idea. So it, it is a long way from having an idea to something that's actually a, a commercial product. So this this figure basically shows our plans for sort of verify the uh, both the technology and the commercial potential of of this uh, this invention. So it has like uh, several steps. So technology basically optimize and validate using like more external data sets and also to start documenting the technical performance. So this is a medical device, so there are like quite strict requirements for that. If it's a product, of course, uh, describe the requirements for the product and test that in a relevant environment, as for like design and development. And then also like a clinical document that is safe to use and the benefits are actually what we claim they are. And also on the market side, like engage industry, like secure partnerships and, and so on, and especially work on the regulation part of Medical devices have a strategy and plan for how to do that and draft the technical documents and, and so on. So in this project, I didn't put the timeline. I think our plan was to spend about two and a half years on, on this. And in the Research Council of Norway, there are so-called commercialization projects that have the two phases shown here, like qualification and verification. So our plan was basically to ask for money there to continue this project as, as UIT. But then the Statsstøtte Regelverket put an end to these plans. So it turns out that because Medsensio, a company, is co-inventor of the patent, like getting money for to, to further work on that technology was considered as illegal support for a private company. So basically, we couldn't apply for this, this, this funding. But we have gotten some money to continue on the research side. So Odd Batch Group recently gave us a grant basically to validate the technology, collect more data to validate that. And we also got like a few uh, last week, I think it was a grant from Hansen Moore 
to basically do the Trons uh, study eight. So we're going to collect like uh, heart, lung, and car echocardiography data in that study also. But that's in 2025. And back Yeah, because the uh, financing of uh, these commercialization project is important, and it's one of the things that the TTO can help with. Uh, and it's one thing we were looking at uh, for this as well. Um, so these are the, the programs we most commonly use, the qualification and the verification that Lars already mentioned. It's the most common, it's the go-to uh, programs. Uh, in this case, it was uh, hard because the state aid rules says that they want uh, public funding, uh, should not uh, support or aid financially uh, private entities. And since uh, Metasensor is a private entity, uh, they were not, um, uh, we were not able to carry this on. And one of the things that, why this is, is important is also so that uh, we increase the value of the technology before we license it to uh, industry. So by uh, getting funding and doing more verification and getting really the, um, uh, the project ready, means that when we are able to go to an industry, they will be more uh, interested in the project because it's closer to the market uh, and it's less efforts for them to realize uh, it uh, afterwards. So uh, I think uh, normally uh, when we have this kind of, um, of collaboration, and especially if there's private entities, we can sort of avoid this situation uh, uh, by um, having private entities uh, being part because they can sign over their IPR to the university and then they can be uh, and then we would be in a position to apply for this funding. Uh, the alternative is, is that the private entity is doing this themselves. So this is uh, where we're at now with, the, uh, with this um, um, project. We are looking at licensing it out to Medsensio because the uh, Medsensio is the most obvious um, obvious partner in this uh, area, and it's not done yet. But uh, we have started the negotiations here, um, and hopefully it will um, will uh, end with uh, a license agreement not too far away. And the, this slide is just showing. Uh, to give you some input, because when we're talking about um, software, and this is Panikla's uh, picture, by the way, uh, and this is just a, a, an overview of the different steps in uh, in the software, where Panikla sort of had looked into where are the the most important parts of the of the software, which is tricky, which can be replaced, maybe for reverse engineering and the blue line and the, the white box is where the patterns are covering uh, some of the uh, on the IPR. But there still might be uh, uh, important stuff in the in the software that should be kept secret or uh, is uh, important uh, from uh, from an IPR point of view. Yeah, yeah. So that was sort of the commercial part, and now we're back again to the science part. So, so we have the plan to set, but we also, as said, we want to do open science. And this is a machine learning project, and the outcomes are typically there's an algorithm, a paper, some code, trained machine learning models, data and annotations, and outreach things like uh, this seminar. So usually, of course, we, we do this usually also in the other projects, but we don't really care that much about the licenses. But here is a commercial interest, so we actually spent quite some time actually figuring out what are the correct licenses to use. Yeah. Uh, which are those things? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because when we're talking about IPR, and we already covered the patents because they have high value and, and it's uh, hard to get around, but there are other ways to protect um, uh, the IPR of a project. Uh, we have trade secrets, it's often used, but uh, then it's uh, a bit of a challenge working with universities because you know uh, researchers should publish uh, their, their work uh, and you also have um, something called uh, trademarks and design uh, that you can also protect uh, your your technology with but that is usually close when the technology is closer to the market or entering the market so it's not 
that often we we go for that kind of protection. So from this project, we had the code and the algorithms, and uh, you get an automatic protection with copyright for code and algorithm. It's the same uh, principle that applies if you write a book or if you uh, make some music, it's yours. So you can decide what you want to do it with it. And then you can, of course, apply it for a patent uh, if it's uh, feasible. But then uh, talking about um, the university, you might also want to publish it. And then uh, you might also want to control how it's used um, in when you publish it. And then uh, you can choose this open science software licenses and there are differences between them uh, to regulate it and I'm coming back to that uh, um, in a minute. Uh, in this case we also had the data set uh, from uh, Thomas and Nossarkelsen. That is proprietary uh, and it's not part of the project, it's not licensed out. Uh, so there's not really an IPR in, in this project. But then we also had the modified data set uh, uh, which was an outcome of this project, and this is uh, uh, it's not published and it's being kept as a trade secret uh, for, for the licensee. Uh, the train models, that's a bit of a conundrum for, uh, for a lot of, uh, of lawyers because they don't really know how to define trained models and AI, uh, so um, it they don't really fall within copyright or within a, a database or whatever. So uh, there's still a lot of debate and I'm not going to call too much about that. And this, and this is also a scientific paper, which uh, like, like a book will have a copy, will be copyright. So these are the uh, sort of trying to um, just summarize uh, IPR and how you can regulate uh, the use when you publish. Because uh, the copyright meaning that it's the author of the code uh, that holds the, um, uh, or owns the technology and the code. Uh, and then you can, of course, publish it. Um, and then uh, if I want to use something that Los Ailo has written, I would have to, enough to violate the copyright, I would have to ask him, is it OK if I use your slides uh, for another presentation? That is quite... Um, cumbersome, uh, especially when it's uh, uh, on the internet. So this, uh, this whole open science uh, initiative is also about what they call copyleft, meaning that you can attach a license that says how you're going to treat this, uh, this uh, code without just going back asking uh, the, the copyright holder. And there's different uh, in open source. There's a different uh, sort, uh, sources of uh, licenses you can use. The main thing is copy left, which uh, restricts some of, of the use after. Uh, and it's called permissive, which is basically do whatever you want with it. And then it's proprietary uh, software where you have to pay uh, to, to use it. And uh, a similar thing is used for databases, uh, but it's called Creative Commons license. So it's basically what you see in, in the left hand corner of this slide, because this is a creative, uh, uh, you know, making out this slide deck. That's also called creative work and is covered by copyright. So this slide is mined by copyright. And just so that last don't have to go uh, ask me if he can reuse this, I've used the Creative Commons license saying yes, he can, but he has to say that it's from us and you can't make changes to it. So that's how we get around on it. And there's a whole lot of, uh, of things that you need to consider, especially with codes, because uh, from my understanding, I'm not a, a programmer, but usually you also use uh, copyright, like uh, Paniklas was telling you, you use the Springer algorithm, uh, which is uh, open source. But that license can influence what license you need to choose if you want to, uh, want to publish your uh, software. Uh, I'm not going to go, I think we have to have a, a whole uh, different talk about that. So uh, if you have any questions, you can al always contact us and we can guide you. But it, this is really important, uh, especially in commercial projects.
Yeah, and that's the summary. Here you will see the links to our open science parts, and that's our contact information.